Good evening and uh, welcome everyone uh, to our meeting this evening. You're all very welcome. It's lovely to have you here. Uh, it is a sadly a necessary topic and um, you're all very welcome. Uh, whether it's something that you're personally wrestling with or something that someone you care for uh, or you care about is wrestling with um, or just here to get information because we will either wrestle with this ourselves or know somebody who is wrestling with depression. And uh, sadly, in these last couple of days, we've been reminded in our town of, of just the reality of uh, a loss of hope. Uh, and that's, that's actually what has driven uh, this meeting this evening. Um, my name is Mark Lockridge and I'm the minister in uh, New Life Fellowship. Uh, and one of the men who's one of the elders in our church um, six, eight months ago uh, said we, we, we need to have a, a meeting again on depression because um, this is a, a real issue and people are struggling uh, deeply and uh, because we care about our community and care about the people around us, um, we're having uh, this meeting this evening. Um, if you want to find out more about that particular man, his name's Colin, uh, he's, he's here this evening although he's out at the door at the minute. But uh, there's a little, a little flyer telling something of Colin's story, a trek through uh, depression. Um, we're very glad to have uh, Reverend Robert Robb uh, here this evening uh, to, to speak to us. Uh, Robert, as you'll hear, has had his own uh, in-depth struggle uh, with depression. And uh, he's going to speak to us uh, from the heart and about what he has found helpful um, and giving us an insight. We were meant to have uh, Joe uh, Burke from Pieta House uh, this evening uh, as well to speak about uh, the resources that they have available. Uh, he has had to send his apologies. Something uh, unforeseen has come up and in his line of work we're glad that he's uh, taken care of whatever uh, it is rather than being here. We have some, uh, some flyers and some leaflets uh, from uh, Pieta uh, if uh, you want to take those with you. There are also some uh, leaflets um, about our church and about the hope that can be found uh, in the gospel on the back as well. And you're welcome to, to browse through and take uh, whatever of those. Um, this evening, I'm just going to hand over to Robert in a moment. Uh, he's going to, to, to speak to us. And then um, a little bit of time for questions if you want to ask. If you don't want to ask your question publicly, uh, by all means, come and talk to Robert uh, at the end. And uh, then I'll, I'll say a few things just at the close. So, Robert, thank you uh, for coming. Uh, thank you for speaking on this subject. And I'm just going to hand over to you now. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me, and uh, obviously you're here this evening because of the subject matter uh, that we're going to be uh, considering uh, this evening, and it is uh, a very important subject. It's a subject that uh, is uh, something from which an ever-increasing number of people on this island of Ireland are suffering from, or if they're not themselves suffering from it, then they know someone close to them who is suffering from it. Um, it's uh, something that impacts families uh, and something that uh, I hope, as we look at it this evening, will become uh, easier to understand what's going on. Uh, it's been described as living constantly in a thick, poisonous fog. Uh, someone else has described it as waterboarding of the mind and the emotions. Uh, another description is it's life in grayscale or the black dog. Uh, I have entitled this a stubborn darkness because that's, I feel, one of the best descriptions for it. Um, the condition, of course, is depression. And the reason why uh, I've been asked along to speak on this subject this evening isn't because I'm uh, any kind of an expert on it or that I've written books on it, or have a PhD in studying depression or anything like that. It's 
mainly because I myself have suffered from depression uh, in the past very severely. I think it would be true to say that uh, it's something that I am continually susceptible to, uh, something that I have learned to deal with, and something that I would say at this stage I have even been able to overcome Maybe not completely, but to the extent that you would hardly know that I ever suffered from it or ever still do struggle with it. There's different ways of approaching this subject. Uh, obviously, speaking in the context of church, speaking as one who uh, myself is a minister, uh, I wanted to approach it from uh, a biblical perspective as well as a biological perspective and as well as a situational perspective. Uh, in order to do that, I want to read uh, from one of the Psalms. Uh, one of the wonderful things about the book of Psalms in the Bible is that uh, all kinds of human emotions and experiences are recorded for us in the Psalms. The people who wrote the book of Psalms went through many of the things that we experience today. And that's why it is very easy often to identify with what's being expressed. So I want to read from Psalm 42. Um, here we find David, King David, the King of Israel, expressing sentiments which are consistent with being in a state of depression. Um, so I want to sh read what David says. Uh, I want to say a little bit about depression. I want to tell you a little bit of my own story. And uh, hopefully by the end of the evening, we'll all be better informed as to how we can sort of deal with this subject. So let me read from Psalm 42. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before my God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, Where's your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mitzar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands a steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries ta taunt me, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. In verse 5 of this particular psalm, we read these words. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil? That's another translation. Within me, hope in God. Now, in order to get some handle on what's being written here. You have to understand what's going on in this man's life when he wrote these words. And most Bible scholars agree that King David wrote these words when he had to run for his own life because of problems in his family. His son, Absalom, wanted to take over as king. And he didn't, it didn't annoy him that the only way to do that was to overthrow his father. And over a period of time, he got a lot of people behind him and curried favour with a lot of people until there was a point where most of the people were behind Absalom. David learned about it 
and he realised that if he didn't get offside, Absalom was going to kill him. And so David, very quickly, all of a sudden, had to leave the royal palace in Jerusalem and run for his life. And basically, he became a fugitive and he had to hide in the hills and the mountains and in the caves and in the wilderness around Jerusalem. And whatever was going through David's mind, one thing is certain. When he put pen to paper, so to speak, uh, and wrote this psalm, here is a man who is deeply, deeply depressed. Now, the man that wrote these words was a true child of God. He had a very real relationship with God. And yet, despite that fact that he was a child of God, he went through this condition of what we would call depression. It's important to realize that just because a person is a Christian doesn't mean that they are totally immune from this kind of experience. Some people believe, and you'll maybe even hear preachers telling you, you know, that uh, if you become a Christian, everything in life will go well. And everything in the garden will be rosy and it'll be happy, happy, happy all the day. Well, I don't know what Bible they're reading, but it's certainly not the Bible that I have in front of me. Because if you read through this, you'll find that many of God's choicest saints experienced times when they were really down and some of them found themselves in the depths of depression. So we want to look at this. And the first thing I want us to see here is the condition that the psalmist describes. He speaks about being cast down. He speaks about being in turmoil. In verse 7, he talks about all God's breakers and waves going over him. In verse 3, he says, Tears have been my food day and night. In verse 9, he says he feels forgotten by God. Why have you forgotten me? And also in the same verse, he talks about going about mourning. That seems to be his constant condition. So here's a man who is in a very dark place at this point in his life. He speaks about being in turmoil within himself. Other translations say disturbed inside myself. In other words, he didn't have any inner peace. He didn't have any inner stability. His feelings and his emotions were all over the place. In fact, the word that's used here is the same Hebrew word that describes the continuing murmuring or growling of a wild animal. He's probably referring here to the fact that he has ceaseless inner groans and sighs and moans they just won't, don't seem to want to go away he also can't seem to stop crying my tears have been my food day and night he's not able to control his emotions it seems as if the slightest little thing makes him weep and there's probably a hint too here that he's off his food and doesn't feel like eating Instead of eating, he's just crying his eyes out. So he's off his food as well. My food is my tears day and night. When he says he's cast down, he may well be pointing to the fact that he feels completely worn out. No energy, utterly fatigued, completely flat. The spark has gone out of life. He also expresses that he's overwhelmed with things. That's what he's referring to here poetically when he says, deep calls unto deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. I'm completely overwhelmed, is what he seems to be saying. I've never stood at the bottom of a waterfall, uh, but I've looked at a waterfall, but it's one thing to look at it and another thing to be at the bottom of it, and I'm sure if you're standing at the bottom of a waterfall, it's not a very nice place to be, being pounded with water that just doesn't stop. And that wears you down. Just look at the stones at the bottom of a waterfall and see how smooth they are with being continually pounded and pounded. As well as that, he says he feels forgotten. Verse 9, forgotten by God. 
all of this is how he feels and frankly it's horrible it's an awful way to feel on the 7th of September 1990 so 33 years ago just a few weeks back I was ordained and installed in my first congregation as a minister it was in Dramara in County Down I had completed four years of study three years at the theological college in Belfast and a year prior to that getting two A-levels in order to get into the college because I didn't do A-levels at school I just left and got a job So after four years of study, those four years involved me keeping on my milk business. I was a milkman, delivered milk round the streets of Belfast, and uh, I franchised my own business, so I was self-employed. And so in order to keep money coming into the house, I was married with a wife and two kids, uh, I kept that business going. So I was up at 4.30 in the morning, going out, doing the milk, finishing at about 8.15, coming home, getting changed, going into college for 9.30, at college from 9.30 until half past three, quarter to four, coming home, doing your various homeworks, writing papers, trying to learn Greek and Hebrew, uh, preaching every weekend, uh, and all the things that are associated with family life on top of that. Thankfully, on the 7th, of September I got my first church and I achieved what I had been working hard towards Christmas of that year 1990 we invited my wife's parents down to spend Christmas in the manse and the manse in Dramara is massive there's five bedrooms in it and about three reception rooms and I don't know many other rooms and for somebody who came from a two up two down in Belfast it was like living in a mansion so uh, my wife's parents came and we had a lovely Christmas, really lovely Christmas day. And they stayed over to Boxing Day and went home on Boxing Day. And within 10 minutes of them going home, I was up the stairs in our bedroom, lying on the bed, weeping uncontrollably. I didn't know what was going on. I was just weeping and couldn't stop. It had been a very busy three months from September from the installation and both myself and my wife put it down simply to uh, being uh, tired over work. And thankfully that week I had taken that off as a week's holiday. So I had a number of days before having to go back uh, to preaching and looking after the congregation again. I thought, well, if I get four or five days I'll be fine. But unfortunately things didn't improve. If anything they got worse and as each day passed my emotions were just all over the place Uh, I had very dark thoughts in my mind I couldn't see how I could continue in the ministry I wouldn't go out of the house Uh, whenever it got known that I wasn't well people very lovingly from the congregation would call wanting to see me or to see how I was getting on and when the bell rang in the front door I immediately ran upstairs into one of the bathrooms. There were two or three bathrooms in the house. And I sat with my knees curled up to my chest and my hands around my knees shaking until that person left. Uh, my wife, you know, dealt with them. I just could not face anyone. I lost my appetite over the course of a very short period of time. I lost almost two stone couldn't eat my tears were my meat day and night Uh, my children didn't know what was going on daddy wasn't well I felt a complete failure Uh, I felt that I had failed my wife and kids I had failed the congregation that had called me three months there and I was a nervous wreck I felt I had failed the church that had trained me as a minister and The reality was that, to me, life wasn't worth living. Uh, And during those next weeks and months, I tried to commit suicide twice. Uh, Thankfully, I didn't succeed. (laughs) But I know what it's like to be there and to feel that. In my mind, it was the best solution. 
yes, my wife would be sad. My kids were very young. Uh, one of them was only four and the other one was only two. Um, and, well, when you lose your dad that young, it'll not affect you too much. This was my thinking. And the church, well, they could put this bad episode of calling this fellow who was at a present behind them and they could call somebody else. And I would just be a wee note in the history of the church. They would get on with things. That's the way my mind was thinking. And the way in which I tried to take my life, I planned it so that it wouldn't look like it was suicide, so that my wife could get the insurance money. I could identify with the psalmist in this psalm. I did go to the doctor. He diagnosed severe depression, and I was given time off work. What are the symptoms of depression? Uh, those are just general. So these are the sort of things that a doctor looks for if he's going to be diagnosing depression. Profound feelings of lethargy, no interest in doing things. And that extends to simple things like washing a cup after you've had a cup of coffee. Uh, things pile up. Can't be bothered doing the Hoover. And, not that I did the Hoover, and you know, but I mean, that's the sort of thing I'd be thinking about. Um, so profound feelings of lethargy lack of energy I spent hours in bed for me bed was a safe place so I was going to bed about 8 o'clock not getting up to 11 o'clock and even though I had all that time in bed when I got up I was totally exhausted no energy whatsoever broken sleep patterns really un really tired but unable to get to sleep you'd maybe get a sleep and then you'd waken during the night Unable to concentrate on things. I loved reading. I couldn't read a book. I couldn't read a magazine. You were staring at the page and nothing was going in. Uh, irritability. I am not an irritable sort of person. I think if my wife was here, she would say that. In 42, 43 years of marriage, I don't think I've ever been irritable. But during that period... I was irritable. Feelings of despair. That's why I called it a stubborn darkness. It seemed as if it was never, ever, ever going to go away. Heightened states of anxiety. Hence, running up to the bathroom and holding myself simply at the sound of the bell going because someone wanted to come and see me. Worried like mad as to what was going to happen to my family because I couldn't provide for them. Panic attacks, sense of hopelessness, low self-esteem. I was the worst person ever. Uh, the worst dad that any kids could have. The worst husband that any wife could have. The worst, worst minister any church could call. Weight loss or alternatively weight gain, depending on a person's inclination with me it was weight loss other per other people when they become depressed they comfort it and they'll have four Mars bars before they have their cornflakes in the morning I'm just constantly eating finding comfort in that not wanting to go out I, I didn't want to cross the door outside was dangerous you felt vulnerable just wanted to stay in that safe place of that one room that you sat in. Loss of pleasure in various activities. I love football. Didn't watch a single match during that period. Not wanting to meet people, easily moved to tears, suicidal thoughts, a deep sense of guilt. A doctor will look for three or four of these symptoms over a period of three to six weeks and this is something that is different in your life from what it used to be. You never used to be like this, but suddenly this has started to happen, and it's happening, and it's prolonged. It keeps going on. And if that's the case, then usually they will diagnose that you are depressed. Can I just say, before I move on to give you a definition of depression, can I just say that... Uh, 
Depression is not having an off day. Everybody has off days. You know, you hear somebody saying, well, how are you? Oh, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling depressed today. You're not feeling depressed. You may be feeling down. You might be feeling in a low mood. You might not be feeling great, but you're not depressed. This is my definition of depression. Depression is an ongoing, perpetual, debilitating mood where the individual is overcome with feelings of emptiness, inadequacy, worthlessness, despair, and hopelessness. This causes life to seem pointless, joyless, a burden. And the result is that a person stops being able to properly handle life and its daily responsibilities. That's depression. So having looked at the condition, let's think secondly of the question. And it's a very simple question. David the king says, why am I like this? Why? Why am I cast down? He's talking to himself. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Now in David's case, the answer is actually relatively simple. He was depressed as a result of the way in which he was responding to circumstances in life that he found himself having to face. Okay? What were the circumstances? Well, as I've said, everything in life had gone pear-shaped for him. He had been the king. He was living in the palace. Everything was going well. But then, unknown to him, his own son, so this is a major family issue, his own son is par mad, so much so that he plots the downfall of his da, even to the extent that he's going to kill him, so that he can get what he wants. And by the time David discovers this, Things have advanced to such an extent that he knew he wouldn't have enough support and so he has to hoof it out of Jerusalem. So he's forced to flee as soon as possible and become a fugitive. And he's living out in the mountains, in the caves, hiding for his life. Instead of eating the finest food in the greatest palace in the world, he's now hunted and he's eating whatever he can get his hands on. Life has taken a real turn for the worse for this man. His whole life has been turned upside down, in his case, as a result of events within his family. And for a very spiritual man like David, one of the worst things was that he was no longer able to go to worship God publicly. We would say he wasn't able to go to church anymore because church back then was at the temple in Jerusalem, the one place where God met with his people. And David didn't go to Jerusalem because Absalom would kill him. And that's why he says, I remember when I used to go on the festal days with the multitudes. I can't do that anymore and it's breaking my heart. So that was another reason as to why David was feeling like this. So that, on top of everything else, had pushed David to the limits and maybe even over the edge when it came to his thoughts and his feelings and his emotions and his mental health. He just felt he couldn't cope. And for a time, for a time, he was an emotional wreck. David was experiencing depression as a result of life's circumstances or maybe to to put it more accurately David was experiencing depression on account of how he responded to life's circumstances that he was facing and as someone who has experienced very severe depression and has taken a keen interest 
in this condition for over 30 years. I wanted to try and discover what is it that causes depression. Now the reality is every case of depression is different. And even experts cannot give a definitive answer to the question, what causes depression? But there are nevertheless certain factors and reasons that usually lie behind someone falling into a state of depression. And I want to look at those. So first of all, there are biological factors. Biological factors. Experts who have spent a lifetime studying depression suggest that depression can be caused by various biological factors, things that have an impact on one's biological makeup, chemical makeup. They say that depression is a consequence, a result of having an insufficient level of certain chemicals in our brain. And one such chemical, and probably the most important chemical in relation to this, is what is called serotonin. Insufficiency of serotonin, they say, leads to depression. And that can be caused by a number of things. For example, it can result as it can happen as a result of a post-viral or post-bacterial illness. When I was 10 years of age, I contracted meningococcal meningitis. Uh, my father was away in Germany at the time with his work, and they had to send for him to bring him home because I was taken into what was the Beaver Fever Hospital in Belfast, which was the top place for... Um, uh, really severe fever illnesses, of which meningitis was one. Uh, the day I was taken in, another fella in the next cubicle to me, because you were put into cubicles, and anybody who came to visit, you had to be masked up and all, and they weren't allowed into the cubicle. They could just speak to you through the glass. It was a bit like COVID, I suppose, in some ways. Um, but the fella came into the, the bed next to me. When I woke up the next day, he wasn't there. And I subsequently learned that he died and I had the same illness that he had. I was kept there for four weeks. It was 1970. I know that very well. I was 10. I'm giving my age away. But anyway, um, it was during the World Cup. It was in June or July because Brazil, the brilliant Brazilian 1970 team were playing, and after about three or four days, I walked out of my cubicle down to a place where there's a television, and the big ward matron, her sister, blew her head at me. What are you doing? I get you back. You've got this. Disease. I want to see the football, you know. But I wasn't able to see all the football. So w the reason I told you that is because subsequently a specialist that I was speaking to said that there's a very real possibility that my depression had possibly as its root cause, that's not rooting out other factors, the meningitis that the meningitis virus had affected my brain. My wife would tell you that's probably true. Um, and my brain wasn't producing the amount of serotonin that it should be producing. Other factors are neurochemical malfunctioning, brain disorders, or post-surgery causes. Sometimes you get somebody who goes in for an operation in the hospital and it's a reasonably straightforward operation, or maybe a major operation, and they're not at all depressed. And after the surgery, whenever they're healed, they go home, and all of a sudden, they're depressed. They go into a time of real bad depression. And there are those experts who think that possibly something in the surgery has caused an imbalance in the biology that has resulted in a drop in serotonin levels. Hormone imbalances. Uh, whenever a woman gives birth to a child, there's a day after birth that's often called the blue day or something like that, I'm told, where uh, she feels down. There are women who have uh, post-pregnancy depression. And again, it's thought that that is because of chemical imbalances that have resulted in the immediate aftermath of childbirth. 
A big thing now that experts are talking about is hereditary genetic disorder. In other words, this is something that can be passed on through one's genes. And it's interesting. My son and my daughter, like myself, are both on regular medication for depression. So there might be something in that. And then there's what's called SAD, lack of sleep, exercise and light, and especially light, seasonal affected disorder. Um, So this is the idea that whenever you get into sort of October through to January, February, there's not as much sunshine about, and that has an impact upon your mood and upon your, your, your depression. And there's absolutely no doubt about this. If I'm going to have a dip in how I'm feeling... It's usually sometime between November and January. And it's interesting that my first impact of this was actually in Boxing Day and around that time. So, as you would expect, medication can be very helpful in addressing depression that is rooted and grounded in a person's biology. Think about it. If your depression is biologically rooted, that you're not producing sufficient serotonin for example then what you need is an input of what you're lacking and that should in time give you balance I have been on antidepression tablets now for 33 years and there's no stigma to it you know as long as I take my medication, I'm fine. If I miss it for two or three days, my wife knows immediately. It's just a, a sort of a dip. Daddy, daddy. And I think if it went on and I didn't take it, that I would probably find myself getting worse. But as well as those biological factors, there's also what I call social and spiritual factors. But look at the social first. Family re- relationship problems. David's depression was rooted in family relationship problems. His son caused it. There's a fallout between father and son. And sometimes people are depressed because of problems in their marriage, dissatisfaction with how their marriage is going, suspicion maybe about their partner, Is he or she being unfaithful? Maybe problems with relationships with your kids? Or kids, problems with your parents? They're setting such a high standard. They want you to get A stars and everything when you're not an A star person. So family relationships can be a source of maybe depression for some people. Financial problems... And who of us doesn't have financial problems? Worrying about how you're going to pay the mortgage. How you're going to pay the next bill that comes in. If another kid comes into the house, maybe that you weren't planning for. How are you going to feed that and clothe it and all the other things? And so because finances are tight, you start to get stressed. The next one. And anxiety. And before you know it, you're going down that spiral that eventually gets you down into a hole that it's very, very difficult to get out of. Loneliness. An awful lot of people today sit in their house and they don't see anybody from one end of the week to the next, especially elderly people. People who've been married for years and they lose their partner in life. Their children are maybe away in other parts of the the island or maybe even away further afield uh, and nobody calls around to see them. And loneliness can lead to depression. Abuse. I've spoken throughout Ireland on this subject, and I remember speaking one evening uh, down south somewhere, I can't remember where it was, maybe in Sligo or Dublin or somewhere like that. And a man came up afterwards and he told me that he suffered severe depression. And he put the cause down to the fact that he had been abused by his local priest when he was a child. The priest is actually in jail at the moment. Um, 
And he says an awful lot of people suffer depression because they, they couldn't cope with the fact that they suffered abuse. And it all bubbled up to the surface eventually. Bereavement. Whenever somebody gets bereaved, of course you're going to feel down. How can you not? Especially if it's a child or if it's a parent or if it's your, your, your spouse that you've been married to for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And it's natural in the aftermath of a bereavement to feel down, to feel weak, to feel weepy. But generally speaking, for most people, they get through that. They learn to cope with it. It never goes away, but they learn to manage it. And after maybe three months, six months, a year, whatever, they're they're okay. But some people, they they, they don't get over it, and, and they're depressed continually. Guilt. An awful lot of people in Ireland are hiding guilt, whether it's guilt over something they've done in their family, guilt over behavior that took place during what was known as the Troubles, and they're struggling with guilt, and we'll see how this comes out later when we look at spiritual matters. Wrong priorities. People setting goals for themselves that they're chasing after and chasing after, wanting to get that position, wanting to get further up the, 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 the ladder of their career, uh, and, and they're not making it, and then they feel a failure, and then they feel down in themselves. And alcohol or drugs, people think that alcohol and drugs stimulate you. You know, and gives you a lift. It doesn't. Alcohol and drug abuse are not stimulants. They're depressants. And whilst chugging down a bottle of vodka will make you feel maybe a wee bit easier for a few hours or half a day, when you're waking up after and you're sobered up, you feel ten times worse. Here's an interesting fact. This was a study that was done in the United States of America. They took, I think it was 2,000, I can't remember the exact number, but whatever the number, they took a survey of people who were depressed and they discovered that when they questioned and examined those people, 75% who attended a psychiatric counsellor for depression, the root cause of their problem was either social or spiritual. Now think about that. If the root cause of your problem is social, if you're depressed because your marriage is weak, it's not the way it should be, or your relationship with your kids isn't the way it should be, or whatever, giving you tablets will not solve the problem. All the tablets will do is deal with symptoms. Until you deal with the problem, you're going to continue to feel depressed. And even though this is a a, a statistic, 75% of depression is rooted and grounded in social or spiritual issues, nevertheless, the prescribing of depressing, uh, the, the, the prescribing of tablets for depression is going mad at the minute. It's the second largest type of medication that is prescribed by doctors. Depression is not caused by circumstances, even though I've just said it has a factor. Rather, it's caused in the way in which we react to circumstances. Depression is a symptom either of a biological disorder or it is a reaction to a situational disorder. Don't know whether you know this woman or not. She's a Christian lady from America. She's called Joni Erickson Tata. Whenever she was in her teens, uh, she dived into a swimming pool or into a pool, a lake. Uh, she thought it was uh, deep. Turned out it wasn't. And she was paralysed from the neck down. She's a paraplegic. For the first number of days, 
after her accident, she was angry at God, furious. And then she realized, there's nothing I can do about my circumstances. And there's nothing I can do about what's happened to me. So she had a choice of either continuing to be angry at God and being down and depressed or of accepting her circumstances and getting on with life. She chose the latter. Now she's a world-renowned painter, speaker, and author. Her circumstances are were awful but she chose not to let her circumstances define the rest of her life as a depressed person but I believe there's another cause that can lead to and often is found as a root cause of depression and that's a spiritual disorder many people suffer from depression because their relationship with God and to other people in their lives is not what it should be Many people don't understand that all of life's problems, all of them, stem from the fact that we live in a broken world. We grow up in this world and we think this is the way it's always been and this is the way it's meant to be. It's not. It's broken. It's not functioning the way it's meant to. Whenever sin came into this world, something radical happened. The very cosmos was broken. Our relationship with God was broken. Our relationship with other people was broken. How we behave is not the way we are meant to behave. We're a bit like us men who when we go to the likes of Ikea or some place like that and we get one of those flat packs and we decide, oh, we don't need the maker's instructions. We'll put it up ourselves. And we try to do it and we put it up and it's wobbling all over the place. And you've got about 14 bits left over. And your wife says, is that it? Yeah. You've done it wrong. And if only you had done what the maker said, you'd have got it right. And that's the way we are in life. Sin has come into this world, and the effects of sin are that things in this life aren't the way they are meant to be, and they're not the way one day they're going to be. Whenever things are going to be the way they should be, But we're living in this period where things are all out of kilter. We've read about and seen on our news the terrible floods and earthquakes, Morocco and Libya. If there was no sin in the world at all, those things wouldn't happen. I'm not saying that the people in Morocco and the people in Libya, you know, that God sent us because they were terrible, terrible. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the very fabric of the creation is out of kilter. And so there are tsunamis, so there are earthquakes, so there are hurricanes, so there are tornadoes, so there are famines. And the one thing, most of all, that is out of kilter is our relationship with God. And we try to live our lives the way we think is best. (laughs) Even though the maker says that's not the best way to live your life. Many people suffer the effects of their own sinful decisions you're a bit like Frank Sinatra well I can see some of us are old enough to know Frank Sinatra I did it my way exactly I did it my way and we do it our way but there are consequences to doing things our way if I live my life my way and my relationship with my wife and she lives her life her way in relationship to me as her husband well there's going to come a point in time whenever it's not going to be the best relationship it could be because the way I should be relating to my wife is the way in which God tells me to relate to my wife and vice versa and if I do that then I'll have as good a relationship as husband and wife as one can have in this broken world I will be faithful to her I'll respect her vice versa same with the kids same with everything else and that's why we have problems in work relationships that's why we have problems with drugs and alcohol abuse people are not 
treating other people the way they should. And there are consequences to that. There's fallout from that. And if things are going bad in life, is it any wonder people are depressed? Much of the depression people experience today would be greatly diminished if our lives were lived the way God intends us to live them. The problem is we can't do that. No matter how much you try, you're going to fail. You can't do it on your own. You can only do it if you're first of all right with Christ, right with God through Christ. Only when you have that foundation laid can you then build a sort of God-honoring, self-enjoying life that God intends us to have. You see, whenever a person is made right with God, that affects all of their life. It affects the way they think. It affects the way they speak. It affects the way they behave. It affects where they will go, where they won't go, what they will do, what they won't do. It affects how they view other people, how they treat other people. It's a radical thing. It's not just the decision to become a person who goes to church. That's not it. And often whenever a person gets those things right, life begins to gel. And many of the problems begin to ease. I'll not say go away because they don't. But they ease. Or at least you have a way of dealing with the problems that life throws at you. They think differently. They feel differently. They behave differently. Anxiety levels certainly drop as they live by faith. Many of life's problems that people experience are thus put into a proper God centered perspective and the stubborn darkness begins to ease and I had to learn that there was a time that I didn't think the darkness would ever lift now I am very very rarely down I, I've, I've learned myself yes I've got some sort of biological need. But over and above that, I've come to know God even better. And that gives so much security and meaning to life. Let me, let me read a passage of scripture to you before I close. I know I've talked on a bit here, but King David later on in life, or earlier in life actually King David was walking on the roof of his palace one day okay so the roof of the palace wasn't like that okay because he'd have been in trouble walking on the roof like that the roof of the palace was like that alright it's a flat roof and he happens to see a woman and she's bathing just a house or two away from the palace and she's either completely naked or semi naked he should have been out fighting with his army, but he decided to stay in the palace. And as he sees this woman, he fancies her. And he says to one of his servants, Who's that? Oh, that's Bathsheba. That's the wife of Uriah. Away and get her for me. He's the king. He can do what he wants. So the servant goes over and gets Bathsheba, and she comes over. And you know what happens. David has an affair with her, and she goes back to her house. Not a problem. I mean, her husband's away fighting for David in the army. He'll never know about it. But then a lot of weeks later, there's a problem. And David opens his door and Bathsheba's there and she says, uh, we bit of news for you. What's up, Bathsheba? You're going to be a daddy. She's pregnant. David knows he's going to get caught out. So what does he do? He sends for Uriah, her husband, brings him back from the battle. He's been away for months. He thinks, I'll bring him back. I'll give him a big feed, fill him full of drink, and send him home. And he's bound to sleep with his wife. But Uriah doesn't do that. He's not going to go down and lie with his wife while all his mates are fighting. So he lies on the floor outside the palace. And even though David tries again, he still won't do it. So he sends him back to the battle with a note. And he says, give that note 
to the commander. And the note says, make sure you put Uriah at the very forefront of the battle where the fighting is fierce so that he gets killed. And that's what happens. And of course, Bathsheba then becomes David's wife. Now I'm going to read to you what David wrote of how he felt for a period of about a year when he didn't face up to his sin. So sin's in the background here. Unfaithfulness, conceiving a son out of marriage and all of that. Killing, putting a contract out in a fella. This is how David felt. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. After about a year, God sent a man called Nathan to David and he told him a wee story. The wee story was uh, a guy was coming on a journey and his friend uh, came and he wanted to give him something to eat. But he didn't want to use one of his own sheep. So he goes to the next door and he takes the only sheep that the man next door had and he cooks it and he gives that to his friend for something to eat. And David says, that's terrible. Whoever did that should be punished. He shouldn't have took that man's sheep. And Nathan says, oh, you're right. You're the man. You took Bathsheba whenever you had any amount of wives and concubines. You're the man. And David realized what he'd done. And he says, that period of time when he was silent, when he didn't admit up to his sin, when he didn't acknowledge it, when he refused to deal with it, he says, he was groaning all day long. Your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up. As by the heat of the summer, he was in deep depression. And only when he faced up to his sin and dealt with it, did he then once again know the joy of God's salvation. He came out of his depression. So in his case, the root cause of his depression was some sin that he wasn't willing to deal with. Maybe there's some sins in your life that you haven't been dealing with. And if the truth be told, they're maybe part of the reason why you're not feeling great or your loved one's not feeling great and is in depression. Maybe it's your marriage relationship. Maybe it's your kids' relationship with you. Maybe it's something to do with work, something to do with business. And what happened on this island for over 50 years, you couldn't speak to a meeting like this and say, maybe you were involved in some terrorist activities. Who knows? So what's the solution? Well, I'll give you the spiritual solution and then we'll move on to the practical solutions, okay? <coughs> the spiritual solution is this. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil? Hope in God for I shall yet praise him my salvation and my God and you know what happened David did go back to Jerusalem and become king and Absalom ended up getting killed so whilst there was sadness nevertheless he was returned to his kingship but his hope was in God and there's far too many people in this island and God is an afterthought for them instead of being at the very centre of their lives. The solution to many people's depression lies in them being brought into a proper relationship with God and then living that out in the context of their life in all its various relationships. How else do we deal with depression? You must really want to change a put up their depression can be addictive and I say that from experience once you become really depressed it's very easy to
to identify yourself with your condition. I'm Robert Robb, the minister who has depression. And if you take the depression away, who am I? You nearly lose your identity. And sometimes people, when they're depressed, they actually thrive on the attention that they get. And they do get a lot of attention. So you have to really want to change. And it took me time to realize that I, I, I want to change. I don't want my life to go on like this. I'll do whatever it takes in order for this to go away. Secondly, you have to talk to someone. The old advert used to be on TV, it's good to talk. It is good to talk. And you must be open and honest. And I would say you need to talk to someone who knows something about depression. Thirdly, you need to discover the nature of your depression. Are you depressed because of something that's going on in your life? Or are you depressed because there is a genuine biological deficiency? Now, it can be that the root cause is something that's going on in your life. But that has made you so depressed that your brain isn't producing enough serotonin to get you calm. And you might need to go on to a medication for a period of time to get you stabilized so that you can then deal with the root cause. <coughs> Strong enough to face up to the things in life that aren't right. Deal with the source. Don't deal with the symptoms. Or should I say, deal with the source. Don't merely deal with the symptoms. Because you have to deal with the symptoms sometimes in order to be able to deal with the source. Stop opting out by turning to alcohol or drugs. Some people, when they get depressed, the easiest thing to do is to go down to the wine office or the wine, the off license and bottle of whiskey, bottle of vodka. That'll make me forget about it. It will until the next day. And then you've got an even bigger problem. Not only are you depressive, you're also becoming an addict. Establish a disciplined routine of eating, exercise, and sleeping. There's a verse in the Bible that says this. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we are. It's amazing the way we're put together. And if you aren't eating right, if you aren't exercising, if you aren't getting your sleep, you know what it's like whenever you go to bed and you get a night when you can hardly sleep and you get up the next day? You feel absolutely rubbish, don't you? I was going to say something else. You feel absolutely rubbish, don't you? You do. Imagine if you had that night after night after night. So you need to establish a good routine of sleep. And you might need help with that. You need to establish a good routine of exercise. Exercise actually boosts things within your biological system that make you feel good. Mark swims. I run. Whenever he does two or three mile swim or five or six mile swim or whatever amount of mile swims he does, and whenever I go out and run maybe five or six mile and come back, you feel great. Why? Because the chemicals in your body are working. Eating. It's dead easy to stick a processed meal into the microwave. But it's rubbish. And you're made by God in such a way that what you eat how much you sleep and how much you exercise affects your emotions and your state of mind. Don't be governed by your feelings. I always say to people who I counsel who are depressed, if you are going to go out and exercise only when you feel it, you're never going to do it. If you're going to tidy up that kitchen, it's an absolute mess because you haven't touched it for the last week. Whenever you feel like tidying it up, it's going to be twice as bad next week. You're not going to feel like doing it. I say to people who are depressed and say, oh, I didn't feel like going to church. I don't care whether you felt like going to church or not. Go! Whether you feel like it or not. I don't feel like going to church sometimes, but I have to go because I'm the minister. You just have to go. The point is you have things that you must do in life. There is a discipline to living life. Meet with someone regularly. Reprogram your thinking. Don't allow your thoughts to go down roads that are going to pull you down. Redirect them. And then the last thing, do things with others. 
there's an awful, awful lot more to this subject. I've only just really scratched the surface of it. Told you a little bit about my own background. What I would say is this. If you are feeling depressed, if you know someone who's feeling depressed, take heart. There is hope. I wouldn't have believed that back in 1990. And the number of times I honestly, before God, thank God that I wasn't successful in taking my own life because I would never have seen my five grandchildren growing up. Not to say other things as well. There is hope. There is a way out. But you have to really want it. And part of that is standing back and looking at your relationship with God and your relationship with other people. Can I say thanks to Mark and the elders for asking me? And thank you to you for coming and for listening for the length of time you did. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, just uh, one set of people I forgot to thank. Uh, well, I want to thank you for coming, but also uh, to Enda and Claire Nichols, uh, who have um, hosted the evening and given us this room. Um, uh, and I want to thank them for their, their willingness to host and to... Uh, they recognise the, the problems, uh, that, that the problem that this is in in our community and uh, they've, they're keen to see help provided and we're, we're thankful for that. Um, what I want to do now is I want to ask for the way to pray for you um, and to pray for our community. So just as we sit, uh, let me pray. Father in heaven, you're the God who's bigger than our problems. Lord, I pray for anybody here whose problems seem bigger than them. Whose, whose circumstances or whose things that have been done to them or done by them or happened in the past or going on in the present and it just seems too big, too much and it's like the waves of the sea smashing in one over the other and it's relentless and they can't get a breath. Lord, would you give them hope? Would you shine a light into that darkness? Would you... Uh, Pull them in out of that storm. Let them see that there is a light, that there is an anchor, there is a safe place, and that that is found in you. Uh, Father, I, I pray for people in this town who this night are grieving, mm. whose hearts are broken, uh, for families who are distraught and destroyed. Lord, would you bring comfort and help and hope into this pain-wracked place? And Father, for those who they've been down this path before and, and they still have the scars of grief, or for those who are on this play in this place of, of darkness in our town, Lord, would you bring help and hope and shine light into their darkness? and bind up the brokenhearted and make the wounded live. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you that there is a God who's bigger than the problem that we face and that we can know him. And we thank you that we can know that you're caring because we see that you step into this world, into the brokenness, and go to face pain so that we could have hope. Uh, Lord, I pray for those here and those not here those in our families and those in our circle of friends. Lord, would you grant strength and help. Those who are here tonight who have battled depression and who have come through it and know its lingering effect and know its scars, Lord, guard and keep. Protect their head and their hearts, their minds, their bodies. Lord, keep them secure. Father, we pray that each of us, all of us, would find hope from you and not look for it in stuff around us. 
but that'll fail. Father, be with each person here this evening and their families and the people they care for. Take Robert home in safety and all of us home in safety. In Jesus' name, amen.